three, two, one. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Nine Hole Podcast. This is your host, Ian Miller. Today, I am joined by an absolute legend, 14-year MLB veteran, three-time All-Star, four-time Gold Glove winner, two Silver Slugger. Brett Boone, what's going on? How you doing, man? Hey, Ian. How you doing? I'm, I'm doing great. It's an absolute honor to have you. Um, how's everything going on your end? What are you up to right now? Uh, what am I up to? Nothing. I've got a house full of kids and the, well, they're, they're out of the house. Most of them, but they're off doing it. It seems like they're always coming and going, you know, I got a bunch going to college, a bunch coming back from college. I got my, uh, my oldest boys here is getting ready for his minor league season. So he stays with me in the off season. So, uh, just, just dad stuff, you know, we got the podcast doing that two or three times a week. Uh, and we're gearing up, ready for the Super Bowl. I'm, I'm headed out to Utah to go skiing for a few days. And buddy of mine, Super Bowl party, and then uh, get ready for spring training. I love that, man. That fires me up. So I have uh, what she just turned eight months, man, a daughter. So I like two days ago. So I, I kind of feel the, uh, you know, the dad comment right there. I'm sure time flies, right? I'm sure you can remember. Oh, yeah. You're, you're you're at the beginning stages. So buckle up. It's going yeah, to yeah, be a yeah, wild yeah. ride, but a cool ride, you know. And uh, I look back, I just married off my daughter a few months back, three or four months ago. And uh, she, she married a great guy. Thank you. Um, but still, it, it's kind of a, it's an eerie reality. It's like we're all we're, we're getting older and it's you know i can remember those times just a little girl and and having to get up at five in the morning go downstairs and play and uh then all of a sudden you're marrying her off and you kind of wish for a second that you could have those times back but then but then you think about those times and and how much you you weren't getting any sleep and now you had to get ready for the season so uh it's all good but uh yeah enjoy the the early times but um yeah just at different stages my, you know, my youngest, I have a stepdaughter that's 16 years old. And that's, that's my youngest. Uh, I've got two younger boys that are 19. I, I, they're all over the, they're all over the map, but all doing really well. I love it. I love it. We're just, uh, she just got her two bottom teeth in, man. Where we're at, where we're at, we just introduced her to solid food. So uh, we're kind of going through that, uh, man. It's a, it's a long, steady climb, right? On the, uh, on the journey of, of fatherhood. I, I, I wanted to get you on here. I'm so grateful for your time, man. Um, this is the Nine Hole Podcast where I just try to provide insight to the next generation of baseball players. Um, man, I made it to the big leagues in the Nine Hole. I, I was fortunate enough to get a you know a cup of coffee up there, play a little bit with the Twins, play a little bit with the Cubs. But man, I, being able to have guys like you come on the podcast, talk about your story, talk about the things that work for you, um, and maybe being able to relate some of that um and to what you you know what you say what we hear being able to relate that verbalize it to you know my audience man break it down for them like dude you are man you had an un incredible incredible career i'd love to dive into the bat the glove the success you had throughout the 14 you know your career right um man i'd love to pepper you with questions if it gets to be too much let me know right i'm gonna get excited right so tell me to calm down or move on if if i uh if I hit on something for too long, man, but it, you know, it's no secret you raked throughout, you know, the entirety of your career, 266 batting average, 252 home runs, 1,021 RBI in 1,780 games, 14 seasons, man. What was your mindset um, when you were hitting? I know the game, man, we could go into a long argument. The game may be different now. Pitchers may be doing different stuff. The rules are changing, whatever it is like what, Man, when when you strip it down bare, like what was your approach and mindset um, at the plate offensively? Well, I think as much as the game changes, it, it's still baseball at the core. It's still hitter in the box gets pitcher. Uh, the game inside the game, um, the mental strategy, and and that comes with and that comes with uh, experience. You know, I came to the big leagues. Um, hair on fire. And, and that's all I can remember is minor leagues. It's, I got through the minor leagues pretty quick, uh, had a lot of success, got to the big leagues and thought it was going to be easy and thought, well, I'm going to continue. I, I'll, I'll give you a quick story. It's funny. My first big league at bat, I fly all night, 
and this would kind of give you the mindset I was in as a young player. I get on, uh, I'm mean, playing in Calgary, Canada, and that was the AAA affiliate for the Seattle Mariners. I get the call. I don't sleep all night because uh, I'm thinking about, you know, my first game in the big leagues. It's something we all dream about our whole, our whole, our whole life. So I get on the plane, and it's my first time flying in first class. And I, I probably look like I, you know, I was 15 or 16 years old. I had that baby face and, and I looked young as it was, but I'm in first class and this businessman's sitting next to me and he's asking me a bunch of questions. And I'm sitting there like, ask me questions. Ask me why I'm going to Baltimore. And he asked me, he said, kid, what are you doing flying in first class headed to, headed to Baltimore? I said, I'm going to big league, sir. He said, come on. No, really, what are you doing? I said, I'm making my debut tomorrow. And he said, Really? He said, that's pretty awesome. I said, you want to go to the game? I was going to leave him tickets. He says, I can't go to the game tomorrow. I've got a business, one thing or another. He said, but I'll, I'll tell you what, I'm going to be watching you on TV. He goes, what am I What am I going to see? I said, I don't know what the outcome is going to be, but I said, something's going to be hit very hard my first at bat. And he said, all right, I'm going to hold you to that. So I, I, I still to this day have not, uh, don't remember the gentleman's name or have never come across him. My first at bat, I got a base hit up the middle. RBI, Jay Buhner scored. I remember. I remember getting to first base, and I believe it was Randy Milligan. He was at first base, and I'm, you know, I'm trying to play it cool. I'm, I'm really excited. I got my first hit, but I'm playing it like I've been here and I've done this before, even though I haven't. And he says to me, he says, "Kid, you got two thousand nine hundred ninety-nine to go." As he throws in my first base hit, and I said, "You know what? I appreciate that." But inside, I was thinking. He's way off. I'm going to get way more hits than that in the big mm. leagues. And that was my mindset back then. Now, fast forward, you know, <laughs> I went through a long career of, of some really good times and some great seasons. And I had my, my share of humble pie, too, believe me. Uh, you know, I didn't get the 3,000 hits, but that's how I was back then. That's how I thought. That's That was my mindset all the way through the minor leagues. It's you know, if if you don't know who I am and where I'm going, just ask me and, and pull up a seat because I'm going to tell you, you know, from age 10, I'm, I'm going to play in the big leagues for 15 years. You know, through high school, I had that same mindset. I'd get called in for, hey, what do you want to study in college? I don't care. Just get me to college and we'll worry about the studies. I'm not going to study anyway because I'm going to go play baseball. <laughs> in college, you know, meeting with my counselors. Um, what do I need to stay eligible? 2.0. Well, they get me classes and I'll make sure I get a 2.0. And it, I didn't have a backup plan. I didn't have a what if. That's not how my brain thought back then. Now, get to the big leagues 10 years in, I look back at that young kid and think, wow, was I naive, you know, on how hard this was going to be, what the process was going to be like. But then a side of me thinks because I was so naive, maybe that gave me an edge when I was pursuing, you know, my dreams. And, uh, you know, I'd look for that as a veteran player. I'd look for that young player with that blind faith and just believed in himself. That's what I look for in a young player. And, uh, you know, there was a lot of hazing when I came into the game. I, I had to wear a dress three or four times and they gave me a hard time. I loved it. I mean, I embraced it. I thought that was the way to get through it. But as a veteran player, I really didn't do that that much. I didn't dress the players up. The other guys did, but I wasn't really a big part of it. I, all I demanded as a, a veteran player from a youngster coming up is respect the guys in that room and what they've accomplished. And, and I didn't mind if a guy came up and he was cocky or he was this or he was that. Uh, the guy pitching on the other on the other side tonight who we're facing tonight, whether it could be Greg Maddox or, or, or Randy Johnson, that guy's going to humble you for me. I don't have to humble you as a veteran player. Um, but I look for those young players that with that blind confidence, which they know they're good. A lot of guys talk the talk. Uh, you know, I've, I've met a lot of young players that are first round pick, high draft picks, six foot three, can run like the wind, got a cannon for an arm, big time bat speed. Everybody's been telling them how great they are their whole life. But do they really believe it? Not all the time, not all the time, but that. One player that maybe doesn't live up to the the statistics they look for, the off the charts arm strength, the off the chart bat speed, uh, foot speed, but our baseball players that believe in themselves, I'll take those guys all day long because they're the ones that are going to make it because they truly believe their talk. 
I love that. I love that. So you were um, a, a little bit about that naiveness that you were just talking about, you know, not the not the blind confidence, but having faith in your ability, right? Um, having that mindset, that belief that you're going to get there. Uh, you, you were talking to Jay Buhner, um, I believe the other day, right on the Boone podcast, um, talking about, you know, spring training all stars, right? When the stats don't matter, there are certain guys right. that absolutely, you know, fucking ball out. Right. And then when it does matter, right, when you're in between the lines, guys kind of tighten up. Guys think about it. Guys get scared. You know, you try to go like this and hang on. Right. Um, Man, ways around that. What were ways around that? Ways to get out of a funk, ways to slow the game down. Maybe that worked for you. If if you could maybe touch on some things like that. Well, I think for me, you know, I went through uh, tough times as a young player like like anybody else. You know, I grew up in the game. So, I mean, until. I was an A-ball. My dad was still in the big leagues. So I had a different upbringing than most. You know, I had been around the game. I'd been in big league clubhouses my whole life. But there's a big difference in being in a big league clubhouse as a as a little kid running around. And, and now when you are you have a uniform and it's your job. I mean, it's night and day. It's just as hard for me as any other rookie that didn't grow up in the game when it comes to performing. I, I think early on, you know, I got there, like I said, my first at bat, I got the base hit up the middle. I said, in my mind, I would, of course I did. I'm going to hit 350 in the big leagues. Well, two months later, you know, my first stint in the big leagues, I'm hitting 198. I'm sitting in my locker. I'll never forget it in Seattle next to a buddy of mine who who uh, had a little time in the big leagues at the time, Mike Blowers. I'd played with him in AAA. And I looked at him and I said, Wow big leagues is really hard. And he looked at me and he kind of gave me that. Yeah, no shit. <laughs> and uh, that was my first time where I, it kind of, you know, my, I talk about humble pie throughout my career. That was a first time where it was really humbling for me. And I remember Edgar Martinez at a young age and Edgar to this day is one of my good friends. And I played with him my last four or his last four years of his career. We were, we were teammates in Seattle. And I remember him telling me at the end of my my rookie call up season uh he said booney you're gonna have to look the, you're, you're gonna have to look to hit the breaking pitch because because if you don't you're gonna get abused up here and i took that into the off season and, and i started thinking about it and he was right i got through the minor leagues really not hitting breaking balls but I had the uncanny ability to lay off a bad breaking ball. And in the minor leagues, they go breaking ball, ball one, breaking ball, ball two. And then it would get a pitch to hit. There was a fastball. There wasn't a fastball out there that I, that you could throw me that I couldn't handle. In the big leagues, it seemed like they went breaking ball, break ball one, breaking ball, ball two. Okay, here comes it. Nope, breaking ball, strike one, breaking ball, strike two, high fastball to a young, aggressive hitter. And I was hacking. So they kind of had me out of whack. You know, the big leagues is the big leagues for a reason. They they do things that minor league players can't do or at the time. So it was a big learning process for me. I started to sit on breaking balls. I started to look for off speed pitches and, and started to have some success. And, and success is really what breeds the ability to play in the big leagues. You, you've got to succeed and you've got to find a way individualistically how to do that for me it was sitting on off speed pitches once i once i i got you a few times with a breaking ball a change up now i could get back to being a regular hitter and look for that fastball out over the plate and now the ability to lay off the off speed so it, it's i don't think it's necessarily the same for everybody you know i had, I had a weird two strike approach where i looked for the slowest pitch if you were throw you know if you topped out at 96 and you had a change up that was 74 I'm sitting on 74 really? and you're not going to be able, you're not going to be able to beat me with that change up. You're not going to be me, be able to beat me with a 76 mile an hour, great, greatly located curveball in the corner. I wasn't going to go back to the dugout yelling at the umpire because the guy made a good pitch. When I had two strikes, I was protecting the play. And the only way I could do, I found for myself, that's why I say it's very individualistic. I wouldn't, this is not going to work for everybody, but if your slowest pitch is 72, 74, that's what I'm sitting on. And I'm going to fight off the fastball. You throw me a fastball. My, my job is to just get a piece of it and foul it off, live to fight another day. Hopefully you'd hang me that curveball, hang me that change up out over the plate or leave something, a fastball away that I could just flick and take my base hit to right field. But I always did that. So it's, 
we all have got to find our way what works for us you know it's not coaches yeah i had some people that mentors and and coaches that were a big part of my career and helped me throughout my career but for the most part it's trial and error i mean it's it's taking advice from from people that have done that done it before look to people that play the game the way you play follow them what works for them um pick their brain uh, but basically it's getting in that cage trial and error hitting a million balls hitting off the tee doing all your work to exhaustion to the point it's it's almost like a pga tour player they don't just get on the first tee and become great players they're hitting thousands and thousands of balls on that range tweaking their stance and do i have an oh you know is my back foot closed is it open is my grip am i going to have a crossover grip am i going to have an interlocking grip what works for me uh the same with hitting you know it's what works are my hands right here yeah tony gwynn does this well i'm not tony gwynn i'm right-handed he's left-handed so what works for him might not work for me you know i mentioned edgar martinez was a huge mentor of mine especially late in my career we used to sit there and talk the game to nauseam i mean and just the how to think think through the game uh and we were completely different as hitters we set up completely different now when the when the when the ball was in the hitting area we did very similar things but we got there in a different manner and that's okay everybody's got to find their niche um and and it's just a pride I, I love it so much the game i wish i knew uh the second half of my career what i knew then. i wish i knew that when i first came to the big leagues you know i was just kind of like i said i was a, i was hair on fire man i just was swinging hard and, and i could barely breathe but the second half of my career when i started to really think through the at bat think through the process think through a 162 game schedule and not take each at bat live or die you know it was an approach uh i started to see consistent success and sometimes the pitcher would have my number or that particular game my strategy didn't work out but i knew if i took if i had a plan each and every at bat it, and i used to call it 5d so i'd start thinking about my at bat when i was in the five hole so if it's the fifth inning and i'm coming up fifth this inning all right wheels start spinning who's on the mound what's my what's my history with this guy in the mound who's in the bullpen Who's hitting in front of me? Who's hitting behind me? Uh, what have I done this series? Am I hot? Am I cold? Uh, the guy hitting behind me, is he hot or is he cold? How is he done off of this pitcher? How is he done off that potential bullpen guy that might come in? Now, I've got five hitters to go through all these thought processes and ask all these questions. I get to the on-deck circle. I pretty much have a formula of what I'm going to do. And when I leave that on deck circle, I'm done. Nothing between my, I'm up there to, to execute a plan that I did five hitters ago, started the process. I'm not gonna waver. I've made a decision what I'm doing this at bat. Now, if I'm going up there and looking for a breaking ball or a curve, and I, and I don't wanna say that. It's not a breaking ball, it's not a change of not a curve ball. If I'm sitting soft, which is any off speed pitch, until I get to two strikes. If he comes up and he throws me two fastballs right down the middle and I'm 0-2, I tip my cap and I go, okay, you beat me this round. But if I take that approach and stick with my approach steadfast, you know, a lot of players call it, oh, you're guessing. No, it's not guess. It's an educated approach. I don't guess pitch to pitch. Oh, you know, and you, you probably know, Ian, as a young player, when you first started doing, oh, I know this guy's going to throw me a breaking ball. I know it. And you get up there and he throws you a fastball down the middle. Most young players think, oh, man, I should have been on the fastball. Now they're on the fastball and here comes a breaking ball. In between. The, abil the ability to go up there with an approach and stick with your approach no matter what. You know, I, sometimes I'd go up there and, and it was somebody, that a nemesis of mine, someone who was tough on me, had two great pitches, two plus pitches. Great fastball, great off-speed pitch. And I'd be looking for one or the other because I'm not going to – I can touch both, but I'm not going to hurt you with both. And it might be fastball strike one. I'm not looking for a fastball. It might be fastball ball. I got a one-and-one one count. 
Fastball up and away. Ball two. It's two and one. Three fastballs in a row. I'm looking for a break ball. This is not the time the time to abandon my plan. Because here it's it's coming. It's coming. Now that now the trick is when you get it, don't miss it. Mm. And that was kind of my approach the last five, six years of my career. And when I when I had some of my biggest years, that's the way I thought. And and it was deep. I love talking to to hitters that hit that way. Uh, probably the greatest to ever do it was probably Manny Ramirez. And I used to watch him game in. You know, I, I'd watch him. He'd set up hitters or he'd set up pitchers. And, and I could see it happening. I'd go to my staff and go, listen, I know you're having success with Manny early in the game with this. When it's late in this game is tight. Do not go to the well one more time because he will get you. And he's just sitting there like a little kid with a smile. He's not going to show you a smile. He's just waiting for you. He set that trap the first four or five innings. And you go to the well once too often with Manny, he's going to get you. He was the most disciplined hitter with having an approach I've ever seen. And until I started implementing that, I, I, you know, or when I started implementing that, uh, I enabled myself to kind of max out on on what I was capable of offensively. That's incredible. What do you mean by Manny being able to set the pitcher up later? Well, most guys are up there, and and, and I'm not saying he's setting him up with. He's not swinging and missing uh, at three breaking balls low uh, in the dirt, low and away on purpose. But I'm saying maybe this guy, my, my starting pitcher tonight's got really good stuff. And he got Manny to chase a couple breaking balls and, and made him look silly. Well, Manny doesn't forget that. Now, now, the layman approach to that would be if you're in the bullpen watching as a pitcher or a pitching coach, that the average pitching coach is thinking, Manny's having a lot of trouble with the breaking ball right here. So in the eighth inning with a runner on second and third, hey, we're going to break him ball him to death. Well, that's when Manny's sitting on your neck. He's not Manny Ramirez because he can't hit a breaking ball. He's Manny Ramirez. Maybe that first couple of bats, he wasn't looking for a breaking ball, and you had a good one that day, and he just didn't see the spin. So he chased it. But late in the game, he knows he's kind of looked silly on some breaking balls. He knows that everybody in the park has seen that. You're probably going to go to that well again, and he's not going to – he's going to be waiting for you this time. And that's all I'm saying is having an approach. He was – he was so steadfast and he would not waver. He wouldn't waver. I, I, I remember so many times him taking a fastball early in the game, nobody on, nobody out, fastball down the middle with two strikes and just smiling and walking to the dugout. And I'm going, what is he thinking about right there? What is he thinking? He, he had a bigger plan. And like I said, I think he was one of the one of the greatest as far as the mental approach to hitting I've ever seen. That's incredible. That is absolutely incredible. So that is a game within a game, right? Having an approach, playing, having to, <clears throat> oh my goodness. Like that's, yeah, the that's my, that, that's my, that's my favorite part of it. And, and, you know, the physical part for me, you know, and I've worked with young hitters and it, it's tough for me to work with you physically. Uh, I know, I know exactly how to hit. I know how to think. I know, how, but, but, Sometimes maybe if I'm working with Ian Miller, I know how to do it, Ian, but I don't know if I can get it into your brain with my words how to do it on the physical side. You're gonna have to find that out your own on your own. But is if you want to talk the game and how to prepare, you know, and it and it's different too. Uh, you, you watch, I can tell, I can watch a game and I can tell who's thinking like I used to think. I can tell who's setting up pitchers. I watched that Houston Astro team. The modern day Houston Astro team, they're the best I've seen position by position. They all hit like that. And they're all constantly, if you watch a Houston Astros game, modern day, and, and I'm talking starting in about 2018 to present, you see that team and they're constantly, when the camera's in the dugout, those hitters are constantly talking to each other mm -hmm. and going, this is what this is. This is what he's going to do if he gets to this position. If he gets one, two in the count, he does it. They're constantly sharing information. They're thinking. You know, if a guy goes, if a Bregman goes up there, you throw a fastball away, 0 and 0 count. He takes his base hit to right field. Do not start him off the next at bat with a breaking ball in the middle of the plate with runners on because he's sitting on that. He knows I just took a good, a, a good located fastball and I just hit a base hit. What do pitchers say? 
if they locate a pitch, you as a hitter smoke it. First thing they do is, wow, that was a really good pitch. How did he do that? Nine times out of 10, you've just eliminated one of that one of those pitches for the rest of the game in his eyes. Now, the great ones, they'll come right back. But, you know, my first about, I'll just get set up a scenario. My first about, I get a fastball away. I'm looking fastball away. I get a four-seamer right on the outside corner. I hit a ball in the right center field gap for a double. Pitcher goes, man, that was a good pitch, and he just he smoked that. Nine times out of ten, I've just eliminated fastball away for the rest of the game. And now it becomes predictable. It becomes, what's he going to do next? Well, he's either going to pound me in with a fastball or he's going to try to trick me. I don't want to hit the fastball in off the plate, so I can just ignore that. So I'm going to sit soft, and if you throw the fastball in, it's going to be a ball. I pretty much eliminated fastball away. That's how I used to calculate. And, And it's about eliminating a pitch. If I can eliminate a pitch, man, that makes hitting a lot easy, a lot easier. It's still not easy, but it's a lot easier when... It, the biggest struggles we have as hitters is when they're getting us out with everything. I'm getting them out with the breaking ball. I'm getting them out with the change up. I'm getting them out with the fastball in. I'm getting them out with the fastball away. You're unpredictable. I have no idea because they're getting you out with everything. You can eliminate and have some success on one quadrant of the plate. Well, now I don't have to worry about that for the most part. You got to take it and consider who's catching. That's another thing. Who's catching? Is this guy a real thinker? Does he think with you? Or or does he just want a good pitch to handle if the runner steals? You got to think about that, too. Some guys just put a finger down, you know? I always would think with the catchers because he's he's putting, the, he's putting the fingers down. I'm thinking, who is that pitcher on the mound? Is that a rookie or is that Pedro Martinez? Pedro is going to have a little more control of his game. That's a rookie, and I've got a – a Jason Veritek behind the plate. Veritek's probably going to be running this game, so I'm going to hit off Veritek. Veritek's very smart. He knows what I'm doing. He's watching me. He's watching my body language. He's watching how I take a pitch. And I take a fastball sometimes when I'm looking for a breaking ball, and I think, did I get away with that? Or did everybody notice I just let that pitch go? Well, Veritek probably realized that I didn't move my feet like I was looking for that pitch. And he knows it. So now I've got a chess game inside the game. Now i got an extra game going on with Veritech. I might have to I might have to call an audible at that stage. <laughs> I talk about always not wavering. Well, there are certain circumstances that it's an emergency and I might have to I, I might have to change my strategy due to the guy behind the plate is thinking with me now. So I, this is my favorite part of the game. It's not for everybody. It, it's definitely for players that you know are a little more veteran that 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 have the confidence and and the ability to to focus and, and put it in play. Um, but nevertheless, you know, all players at a certain point, you get to that point uh, where you've got to start hitting like that. Because this stuff at the at the highest level, it's different. When I, when I faced a left-handed pitcher, I could get away with a lot more. I could hang out over the plate and kind of just look for the ball. But if I've got a number one starter with two-plus pitches, I, I'm not going to hit them both. I got to get on one. If I'm facing Randy Johnson, I'm not going to hit his slider and his fastball today. It's just not It's just not going to happen. Now, like I said, I might be able to touch it. Yeah, I can put your breaking ball in play, but I'm not going to hit it. I'm not going to hurt you. If I'm sitting on it, I can hurt you. But I can't, I, I can't just be looking for a, a fastball from Pedro Martinez, and he throws me a great curveball, you know, with an 18-mile-an-hour differential, and I'm going to do damage on both. I'm not. It's like get on one or get on the other. And that's why they're number ones. You know, you can get away with that with the number four or number five. But with the number ones, the guys that have two plus pitches, you can't get away with it. And the guys that say, I just see ball, hit ball. Well, you must be a freak of nature because I can't do that. I can do it at a lower level. But when you get to the playing against the best in the world, uh, the see ball, hit ball thing is is really tough for me to comprehend. I, I, maybe I just wasn't that good. Absolute master class right there and hitting the approach, all that stuff, man, being able to eliminate quadrants, right? If, if he throws you a fastball away and you smack it, maybe you can eliminate that gives you a higher success chance, right? Higher percentage Mm -hmm. chance, man, you eliminate something like that. That's insane. I mean, that, that helps everybody's throwing a hundred a day. There's data everywhere. Um, Man, you, you touched on so many ways that I want to go with what you just said, man, but the data is number one right? Um, being able to formulate a plan, 
back when you were playing, you would do it five five deep, right? So you would start ahead of time. Nowadays, there is data in the dugout. There is video in the dugout, right? There's some rules behind some things, but you know you have access to data. You're able to formulize a plan. Man, where do you see it today with the game? Uh, man, I I'll go I'll go hit with some kids out here local, and there's hit tracks in in the facility. These kids aren't even on varsity yet, and it's a swing and stop. It's not dissect what what that just felt like what that mechanic was it's just look back at the tv screen and see what the ev was you know what i mean and the launch angle and stuff like that man what what do you got on that well i think those those tools are great for um the ball clubs and being able to evaluate and scout and draft i think data is unbelievable they they don't get it wrong too often now in the first couple rounds of the draft whereas 20, 30 years ago, where they didn't have this advanced data, uh, they probably got it right, but they weren't so sure. Nowadays, you either are or you're not. They they got it pretty pretty down. As far as for the player, um, depending on who it is, you know, I don't think advanced data and and advanced advanced technology is good for everybody. I think too much technology in the wrong hands becomes a detriment. Uh, when you've got young 18 year old uh, still forming brains worried about their exit velocity, when they go to the cage to work on their swing, when they know their average ex exit velocity is normally 95 miles an hour. And this particular day, it's 94 2. But they're having great swings and the ball's sounding loud and it feels good off the bat. That should be enough. But you look around, you just had a great session, but now, hey, what was my uh, what was my average exit velo? Oh, you you know you're two miles an hour off your normal. All of a sudden, that becomes a, it, that went from a great session to oh oh no, what am I going to do? So I think that's when it becomes a detriment. You know, I don't think it's good. I I think the technology, I think it's great. Give me everything you can. The thing that I really, the word isn't admire but I'm envious of the current player is the, the data at their fingertips. I was a guy, I just wanted video, you know, and at the big league level, most of the guys I know, especially when you go around the league three, four or five years, I kind of know all the pitchers. Yeah. Occasionally you're going to have a young player coming into the game or somebody that was in the national leagues in the American league. I haven't faced too often. The one thing I want is video. Give me, give me the last time he started and hopefully he's pitched against us before. And you've got a video of that. I'm going to watch that. Nowadays, I've got a laptop that got not only his last start, but every start this year, every start against me, I've got every guy in that bullpen, I've got video from recent games on all of them, and it's all at my fingertips. I mean, I'd sit in my room at night and just go over every, I'd be a kid in a candy shop as far as that data. When it comes to, uh, you know, 82% of the time in an O2 count, he'll throw, I, I laugh at that. I laugh at that. It's it's so it's so ridiculously stupid. It, it's like on my teams in Seattle. Okay, is is Ichiro leading off the game in a zero zero ball game, or am I hitting in the eighth with a base open? I think the pitches are going to be a little different, and you can throw those percentages out the window. So they make no sense to me that what he does in certain situations, and I think every player it. At least I remember. I remember at bats. I remember my history with a with a particular pitcher. He probably remembers a history with me. If I do particularly well off him, he's well aware of that. If I do particularly well off him, I'm well aware of that. Or vice versa. If he had as my number, he's well aware of that too. And it's time for me to make an adjustment because whatever he's doing is working. So we're very aware of one another, especially when you're in the league for a while. So it becomes that cat and mouse game more than the, oh, give me the data. No, I, I don't care about the data. I, I, I care about individual. This is a team sport that's very individualistic. So I, I could care less what he's getting other people out with. He knows and I know last game what he tried to do to me and what I did to him. And he's not going to try to do that again. Or maybe he is. That's the game, you know, or vice versa. It's like, man. You know, I had guys that were my just nemesis of me, like my last three games, I haven't, not only have I not gotten any hits off them, but I haven't even had a real good at bat. What am I going to do different this time? And he knows it. It's almost like as a, 
as a hitter, you can feel it when you walk to the mound. You know, it's like this guy knows he's got my number. How how do I project that this time is different? And it seems like you can't project it. You can't fake it. I used to try to fake it and walk to the plate. When I was one for my last 12, like they announced my name and I'd start walking to the plate. Like, no, no, I'm not one for 12. And I look at that picture and it's like I can see it in his eyes. He knows I'm one for 12. And it's usually a fastball right on the outside corner for a perfect strike. If I'm 10 for my last 12, I'll guarantee it's a scared fastball in the dirt. It's a curveball that misses by a foot. It's just kind of something we as players and we as hitters and pitchers, we just know. And and it seems like when you're going bad, everything's on the corner. Everything's a strike. You're behind in the count every at bat. And when you're going good, you can feel it's almost like they're really careful how they pitch to you. And it's usually, usually it's 1-0. Usually it's 2-0 count. You're in a lot of 3-1 counts. It's because you're being successful. You're seeing the ball well. You're getting everything ready in your swing early and on time. Ride that because that doesn't always happen. You know, it, it's hitting hitting so hard. You're going to go in and out of those grooves. But uh, I don't know. That's that. That's the chase, and that's the that's the real challenge of hitting at that level, um, and having success. And it's it's pretty awesome. Like I said, I mean, I've already talked too long about. It. I could talk for days about this. No, no, I love it. That's a that's spoken like a three time All Star, two time Silver Slugger right there, right? That's incredible. The game within the game, man. The that's an absolute masterclass. I love it. I I am so grateful for you opening up about that. That's that's a different type of level that you know at least people that I know haven't even unlocked yet, right? I I feel like I wasn't even conscious of that type of stuff, man. Maybe until I got out of the game. Right. You play it. You're doing that consistently over 14 years in the in the show. That's unbelievable, uh, man. That's amazing. I wanted to switch kind of topics a little bit, man. Uh, be conscious of your time. I am extremely grateful. Your podcast, man, um, the the Boone podcast. It's fantastic. You you were on there talking a little bit about Gary Sheffield, right? Being not making it right into the Hall of Fame. Right. Um, but I wanted to talk about Ichiro. Ichiro coming up, you alluded to, you know, being his teammate, that 2001 um, season, man, magical season, all that stuff. Do you think he's going to be a unanimous, uh, you know, first ballot Hall of Famer? What do you got on that? Um, If history repeats itself, no, because there's only been one, Mariano. Uh, Now, as a player, a guy that's played against a lot of guys and, and played against a lot of Hall of Famers, um, I think there should be a lot of unanimous, you know, there's no reason that Ken Griffey Jr. had people vote against him. Uh, who are the people that voted against him or, or didn't vote for him? Were the numbers quite not there for you? I don't understand. So, uh, I don't think he's going to be unanimous, but each road definitely has those magic numbers and he'll definitely be a first ballot hall of famer. Love it. Love it, love it. Um, we have somebody in the chat here asking a question. Who was the hardest or the most skilled pitcher that you've ever faced? Who was, who was the toughest A.B. against? Well, I, you know, there were a lot of tough ones. But I would say uh, I, I've got my go-to answer when I'm asked who, the, who were the toughest pitchers. I think the greatest pitcher, in my opinion, who I ever faced, who I ever saw, Greg Maddox, mm. year in and year out. And that's not the nastiest, but just the consistent year in and year out, game game after game after game after game. Some guys, you know, they dominate, and then they have an off, they have an off game, and they give it. When Greg was missing, he was missing by inches. Like a bad game for Greg Maddox in his heyday was – seven innings, giving up three runs. That was like the worst. He was so consistent. He was robotic. It was like a, it was like facing a technician. His bad games were better than most best games. So I would say Greg's the, the, the best pound for pound over a long sample size pitcher I've ever seen, maybe the greatest in the history of the game. But uh, that that rotation at that time, you know, my stock answer is, hey, who's the toughest pitcher? I just say Maddox, Smoltz, Glavin. 
in the nineties, going to Atlanta was an absolute nightmare. And I, did, I didn't have much success, but uh, not nastiest, but the greatest technical pitcher uh, is Greg Maddox. I love for it. Me. Oh, I love it. That makes a ton of sense, man. Uh, two more questions here. I got for you, man. So obviously you've, you've put together, man, an incredible, incredible career. Um, extremely dominant hitter, un- unbelievable with the glove. Um, what are, you know, some tips or advice to the next generation of players that are MLB hopefuls, right? Every kid that plays baseball wants to play in the big leagues one day. Every kid that's in high school wants to be a division one player or get drafted. Everybody that gets drafted, you know, wants to make the show, man. What, like what, what, what can you throw their way, man? A little tidbit. Well, I think today's game is different. I think you need to be, um, you, you got to be passionate about it. Because the kids, the, the athlete today is is too too skilled if you're not passionate enough, you know, about the game. So obviously pick what you're passionate about. For a young player, I, I think, especially when you're a kid, be a kid. Enjoy life. If you're a good athlete, play all three sports. Find what you're passionate about. When you when you do find that, and, and usually later in high school when you're going to focus in on, on one sport, set goals. Uh, be disciplined. Find something. Um, when you, when you set off to to complete a task, when it comes to your game, complete that task every time. Makes your brain stronger. You know, if you say I'm going to do this, when you say you're going to do something, do it. And I mean every time. That will make you stronger in the in the end. I I used to do that with diet as a as a baseball player, and I thought. I'm playing on the field with Alex Rodriguez and Ken Griffey Jr., just people that are just born more skilled than me at this game. How do I compete with them? Well, I've got to, I've got to give up something. So uh, for for the off season, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna have a piece of white bread or a diet soda for four and a half months because that's a part of my off season. That's a big give for me. Um, and when I get to spring training, I know that nobody around here did what I am gonna do. Now, does that make me a better player? No, but it makes my brain stronger because I'm disciplined. And I know I can look around that room and go, you didn't do that. You didn't do that. I don't know anyone in this room that did what I just did, what I just gave up. I say that our biggest tool is our brain. That's our biggest tool. How can we trick our brain? How can we strengthen our brain? Even the best players I've ever been around. Uh, they have their insecurities. They all have those 0 for 10, am I ever going to get a hit again moments. But they have the ability with experience to know that you'll get through it. Um, but but the, the ability to trick our brain, that's the biggest thing. I found the way to do that is give something up that's important to you. Because if you can give that up, uh, you can do anything. That's incredible. That's incredible. A master class right there. Last question I got for you, Brett. Um, man, this is the Nine Hole Podcast, right? Where I'm trying to give insight, information to the next generation of players. You know, I I, I was a nine hole hitter. Um, man, what do you think about when you think about a nine hole hitter? Um, you know, somebody hitting in the nine hole, what kind of traits or characteristics do you think a nine hole hitter should possess? Well, I think the nine holes changed. It's different now. It's it's not, you know, nine hole when you're in little league is the worst hitter on the team. It's ninth. That's just the way that's it, the way it is. That it, that's kind of changed now in modern day, especially in the professional game. If you're stacked with uh, two real good, you know, speed oriented players, and they both could be really good players, both lead off type hitters. Well, if you're lucky enough on a team to have two really talented lead off hitters. Instead of hitting them one, two, because you might have an Aaron Judge nowadays. You know, when I when I was playing, the best hitters were hit third, fourth, and fifth. The setup guys were two, one. Now kind of the best hitter is is two and three. The best hitter on the team usually is hitting second. So that that's changed from a big league thinking perspective. Um, so you're going to have an Aaron Judge, maybe a Soto type in the two hole, where that used to be the, for that little guy that would move the runners around. Now you got your banger in the two hole. So if you if you're fortunate enough to have two of those top of the order, prototypical leadoff hitters, speed guys, uh, you got two of them. One of them is going to be in the nine hole now, you know. And, and it's like, man, 
they've got him hitting ninth. What a pain in the neck. We expect as, you know, as pitchers, once we get that past that five or six hole, easy sailing. Those are an easy four outs. But a lot of times now you got that nine hole guy. That's going to be tough because he's not a nine hole hitter. What he is, is he's the second best leadoff hitter on this really good team. So uh, I, I think I think the the definition of the nine hole has changed over the years. And I think you see a lot of talented guys maybe hitting in that nine hole. I love that. I love that. That's fantastic right there. Brett Boone, thank you so much for your time coming on here and educating us a little bit, man, about the art of hitting, um, the mentality behind it. Uh, just just before we get out of here, I'd love to thank the sponsor of the show uh, today. stream, the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, the Cleveland Student Visionaries of the Year. Um, they're currently on their seven week challenge to raise funds for the fight against blood cancer. Check out their link in the description. Appreciate everybody for being here, Brett, man. I am so grateful for your time. This is awesome. Thank you for coming on here and just, and just giving us all that knowledge right there. You got it, Ann. My pleasure. All right. Thank you guys, everybody for tuning in. We'll catch you next time.